Hello and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies with your speaker, Chris McCann. If you'd like more information or to hear more studies, visit our website at www.ebiblefellowship.com. And now, with your evening Bible study, here's Chris McCann. Good evening and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Bible Study in the Book of Revelation. Tonight is study number 14 of Revelation chapter 13, and we'll be reading verse 10. Revelation 13, verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, this verse is unusual in the context that we've been reading. It sort of stands out. God has been uh, getting into information, details concerning the beast. And now uh, he is just out of the blue, it seems, uh, just out of nowhere, mentioning, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. And he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. What, what does this mean? Well, we're helped, of course, when we turn to other places in the Bible and we see information that matches it, that agrees with it. For instance, in the book of Jeremiah, in Jeremiah chapter 20, it says in verse 4, For thus saith Jehovah, Behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself and to all thy friends. And they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and thine eye shall behold it. And I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive into Babylon, and shall slay them with the sword. So there we see the captivity and the sword, just as in our verse, uh, leading into captivity and killing with the sword. And here, the king of Babylon will take all, or, or God will first give up all Judah, and he will carry them captive into Babylon and shall slay them with the sword. And the king of Babylon is used in the Bible as a type of Satan, especially as Satan is loosed at the end of the world, at the time when God um, is judging the churches and congregations. Judgment begins at the house of God at, at the same time Satan is loosed. It's also the time of the Great Tribulation. And that means that if we're correct, that he that leadeth into captivity is a reference to Satan. He that killeth with the sword is a reference to Satan, just like the king of Babylon will take all Judah into captivity and slay them with the sword. And he's a picture of Satan. Now that helps us to understand why God is saying this at this point, because he has just been talking about in the previous verses of Revelation chapter 13, the loosing of Satan when he comes up out of the sea and he comes against the camp of the saints. As we read back in verse 7, it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Uh, that's who Judah represents, the New Testament church. That's where the saints were located within the church throughout the church age period. And, and so that helps us to see that the Lord in saying, He that leadeth into captivity, Satan shall go into captivity. Now, we would have to understand that Satan and his emissaries or his forces as uh, he has ministers of righteousness, those that are unsaved and they have infiltrated the New Testament church and risen to positions of power and authority. And through them, Satan exercises his power and authority over the doctrines of the church, over the course that the church is taking, the direction that they're headed. And so, they that lead into captivity themselves will go into captivity. They that are killing with the sword will be killed with the sword. It, it's a principle that God is establishing. 
and in a sense, he's encouraging his people. He, he's speaking to his elect because at the end of the verse, he mentions here is the patience and faith of the saints. And we'll discuss that when we get to it. But by letting them know that, yes, there will be a time when the church is overcome, when those in the congregation are being spiritually killed, which the sword represents that which kills you slay with the sword. Well, uh, let's look at another uh, verse in the New Testament, another a couple of verses in Luke chapter 21. In Luke 21, it says in verse 22, For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. There again, in that context, the Lord is talking about the judgment on the church. That was the disciples' question to him in Matthew 24, what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? And Luke 21 is a parallel chapter to Matthew 24. And, and so Jesus is speaking of the judgment on the church, which uh, is characteristic of the great tribulation. And he likens it to um, falling by the edge of the sword and being led away captive into all nations. Jerusalem, which is a figure of the corporate church, according to Galatians, there's Jerusalem above, which is the eternal church, and Jerusalem, which now is, which is the earthly church, the corporate church that has buildings and, and people attend. And that Jerusalem, the corporate body, because you can't uh, tread underfoot the heavenly Jerusalem, but the corporate body is trodden down of the Gentiles, and the Gentiles, um, it, it could be translated nations, it, they're synonymous, until the times of the Gentiles or nations be fulfilled. And that reminds us of Revelation 11 in verse 2, But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city, Jerusalem, and, and that's another way of referring to the church, shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. It, all the language fits together and, and matches and agrees so that we, we, we know exactly what it means. It's speaking of the end time judgment on the church and God calls it as he did in Jeremiah. But um, maybe some people have a difficulty with, with understanding the historical parable that the judgment on Judah was and the going into Babylon, into captivity and so forth, it was. But here God makes it a little plainer in Luke 21, uh, really using the same type of language, the same pictures of falling by the edge of the sword and being led away captive into all nations. That also helps us to understand Babylon is representative of all nations. It, it is the kingdom of Satan, and Satan was given all the kingdoms of the earth, all the nations um, were in subjection to him. He had won that right through conquest in the Garden of Eden. And, and that's what the Lord is referring to in our verse, in Revelation 13, verse 10. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. And by the way, the word he, it actually in the Greek is if any. If any leadeth into captivity uh, shall go into captivity. And it's repeated. If any that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. So those that identify with Satan, with the beast, with uh, those that are in his kingdom of darkness, they will have a period where they are victorious. They have triumph. 
they will take captive the church and all those um, people, the unsaved within it. They will kill with the sword the unsaved and those in the churches that think that uh, they're going there for blessing. Well, there'll be no blessing. They will die. They they will believe the lies, the strong delusion that are being told them concerning, yes, God is here. No, don't listen to that idea about the end of the church age. And certainly you don't want to leave because this is where the blessing is. This is where God has commanded us to meet. This is where you partake of the Lord's table and where you can have your children baptized. This is the place that God has ordained and and so forth. And and yet in keeping them captive, the, the uh, these people within the church, they are killing them. And they're um, destroying them through deceit. Well, uh, the word lead or leadeth, that's here in verse 10. He that leadeth, or if any that leadeth into captivity, shall go into captivity, is only translated here, as far as I could tell, as leadeth. Uh, it's normally translated as gathered together, or gathered together. It's the same word that is in Revelation 20, and, and I'll start reading in verse 7. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And again, we're reading a commentary on that in Revelation 13. The, the whole chapter is, is telling us what happens once Satan is loose, once the beast comes up out of the sea. And then in verse 8, And shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. The um, English word here, uh, gather together, is a translation of the same Greek word that's translated as leadeth He in our verse. He gathers together the nations, and again, remember, the nations are the Gentiles. The English word Gentile or nation is, is a translation of the same Greek word. He gathers the Gentiles together to battle. He leads them to battle. And this has uh, much to do with Satan overcoming the church and gathering the churches themselves together. And he is Gog and they become Magog to do battle with God and his people in the day of judgment. And of course, they're going to lose that battle and have lost that battle. But that's what God is saying here. If any gathereth together into captivity, they shall go into captivity. If any that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. They have done this to the people of God, even though uh, in many cases it's just a profession. Yet, they had the name of God. The church was God's institution for almost two millennium. The church is where the Bible was. And, and, and so Satan did this. Yes, it was according to the purpose and design of God. That's why the Lord loosed him to accomplish his purposes as a destroying instrument to bring desolation to the congregations of the world. Yet God turns around at the completion of that judgment on the church, which was 23 years exactly to the very day. And God then judges Satan and his forces. We need to remember Revelation 18 verse 6 in speaking of Babylon Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she has filled, fill to her double. That is, she took you into captivity, take her into captivity. She killed you with a sword, kill her with the sword. Kill Babylon and bring the sword upon Babylon. We read this. 
in our study of Jeremiah 50 recently. And I want to turn there because it has a strong emphasis on bringing the sword upon Babylon, which is the kingdom of Satan. And it says in Jeremiah 50, beginning in verse 35, A sword is upon the Chaldeans, saith Jehovah, and upon the inhabitants of Babylon, and upon her princes, and upon her wise men. A sword is upon the liars, and they shall dote. A sword is upon her mighty men, and they shall be dismayed. A sword is upon their horses, and upon their chariots, and upon all the mingled people that are in the midst of her, and they shall become as women. A sword is upon her treasures, and they shall be robbed. Ten times a sword is upon um, this or that of Babylon, pointing to the completeness of the wrath of God, the complete judgment upon Babylon, the unsaved inhabitants of the world that are said to be in Babylon because Satan is likened to the king of Babylon. And and Judgment Day, as Jeremiah 50 and also 51, is uh, describing the day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath, which uh, we have entered into since May 21, 2011. Judgment Day is a time of a sword upon Babylon. And yet Babylon previously, earlier, had the sword upon the people of God, or, or the saints, where the saints were located. As Babylon destroyed the church under the rule of Satan, so God is destroying Babylon. And, and that's why the Lord is encouraging his people as he's addressing them in Revelation 13.10, that yes, those that are presently leading into captivity, they themselves will go into captivity. And they that are killing with a sword, they likewise will be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. That is, you have to, you have to wait. You have to endure hardship and, and tribulation. Not only tribulation, but great tribulation. It's the time of the end. The, the final days that the Bible has um, so often discussed and pointed to have arrived. And, and here, my people, you will have a need of patience. Why? Why is there a need of patience? Well, remember what we read in Luke 21. And, and uh, again, Luke 21 is that parallel chapter to Matthew 24. When Jesus is answering the question, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And um, in the middle, really, of discussing these things, uh, let's see, yes, exactly the middle, because Luke 21 has 38 verses. And in verse 19 of Luke 21, God says, In your patience possess ye your souls. And then the next verse speaks of Jerusalem, and when ye shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. When you see, and that isn't with our physical eyes, but with eyes of understanding, with ears that hear, when we know from the, the teaching of the word of God and and, and by God's grace, he opens up our eyes to see these things, then you will have a need of patience. In your patience possess ye your souls. Now, of course, patience um, points to Christ. In Christ is really where our souls are kept and, and possessed. And, and nobody can lose that. But there is also an outworking of that in our lives. Yes, Christ is patience. He is also faith. Yet we, uh, through the Spirit, have faith. Christ is love. Yet we, through the Spirit, may learn love and show love. And he is patience. And we, through the Spirit, may develop patience in our life. And learn to wait on the Lord for him 
to do the things that he has said he will do. Well, the time of the Great Tribulation was a time in which patience necessarily had to be exercised. God's people needed patience because uh, the church had been around for 1955 years. Christ was in the midst of that organization, in the midst of the church. The church is where the people of God would go to find comfort, to, to find strength, to be encouraged in the walk uh, of a Christian and, and where they could find others like-minded. And now God was about to make a dramatic change, a, a, a drastic shift in that program. He ended the church age. He brought judgment on the churches and congregations. And the churches no longer uh, were feeding the people of God, no longer nourishing God's sheep, no longer taking care of them, but rather feeding themselves of them. And and more and more, the teaching within the church uh, was apostate and grievous to the child of God. And he began to search and go from church to church. And is, is this a place where I can come and bring my family? And maybe for a little while he stay and then something else would arise. He, he couldn't find a place, but he didn't know as yet. It wasn't God's plan early on during this time to reveal all the information concerning what he had done um, against the church. But eventually God did open up his word to show what he had done, that he had left and abandoned the church and turned it over to Satan. And you must get out. You must flee to the mountains and and depart out of the midst of the congregation. And all of this, uh, there, there was a great need of patience. Now, God's people were, uh, in many cases, on their own. They had no pastor to help them. They had no elders to help them. They had no deacons to help them. They, they had no congregation for fellowship. And, and God, in his command to flee to the mountains, was focusing his people's eyes on the word of God, the Bible. And of course, God also arranged for a faithful ministry at that time of family radio. The Lord raised it up. And, and also, God raised up the electronic medium so that the people of the Lord could be reached outside of the churches and congregations, as well as that great multitude the Lord later intended to save could be found through primarily through the electronic medium. But here is the true believer. In time past, he would be at his local church and others would be around. And, and that's a comforting thing. And he would have Bibles, and he could uh, talk to um, the, the pastor, and, and it was just a good place to fellowship if, if it were a right church. And when Christ's Spirit was in the midst, the, the church could uh, be faithful to some degree, and it was where God wanted his people to be. And it was a place to bring your family. And, and children could meet other children uh, and, and hopefully grow up in the fear and nurture of the Lord. But now men and, and women and their families were on their own. And it all required tremendous patience. And as uh, God says in James, in James chapter 1, and I'll read from verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into divers temptations, or temptations as, could also be translated as testings, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. This was a trial. It was a great trial, great tribulation. And there was a trial of faith concerning trusting the Bible and the things that were coming forth from the Bible. Uh, it, it was never heard of before that the church age would end and, and you couldn't 
uh, gather together at your local church. But now this was coming from the Bible. Would you trust it? Would you believe it? Would you take action upon it and come out of the church? Well, yes, God's people did. And that began a trial. There was a trial of believing the word and then afterwards living in the world outside of the church was also a very trying experience for the people of God. Thanks for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Evening Bible Studies. You can hear these studies Monday through Friday over Pal Talk, Skype, eBible Fellowship's webcast audio, or over your phone. For more information or to hear other studies, visit www.ebiblefellowship.com. Until our next study, may the Lord's perfect will be done.